Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody back in here again. I see you all got your coffee cups with you, and uh, we're ready for another half hour. For those of you joining us on television, we trust you'll do the same. My goodness, you don't have any idea how many people write and say, well, we get our coffee cups and... Uh, we get everything all ready for your half-hour program because we're on in the early morning in most of the places around the country. And uh, so we appreciate those little tidbits. And uh, as I've said so often before, many, many have written that they feel like they're sitting right back there in the back row and uh, just make it a classroom effect. And that's what we've always wanted to do. We uh, don't intend to make this seem like a church service. It's not a worship service. We're here just for a Bible study. And uh, hopefully you can take your knowledge of the Bible and share it with your church people, your Sunday school people, what have you. But uh, we don't attempt to take the place of the church, nor do we attempt to put the church down by no stretch of the imagination. All right, now we're in the book of Hebrews, and as I've been stressing in our introductions, that uh, Hebrews is written, we feel, by the Apostle Paul, but he didn't put his name to it because he knew the Jews had a bad taste in their mouth about what he had done with their religious system. He had turned his back on it and uh, was now contrary to what they thought was the keeping of the law. But uh, nevertheless, the evidence is quite uh, insurmountable that he is the writer and he's addressing it to Jewish people who are having a hard time overcoming the pull of Judaism to step out of the law and the ramifications of it and simply to, uh, trust that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the King of glory. He's the Son. He's the one who satisfied all the demands of a holy God and by simply putting their trust in Him. And so all through this first chapter of Hebrews, we're seeing Christ elevated to a place high above the angels. He's the creator of everything. He's the sustainer, even as Paul writes in Colossians. And uh, now we've been seeing in the last couple verses how that indeed he was the one who created everything. And then in our last part of the last program, we saw that all of this glorious creation is hearing the death knell. One day, it's all going to pass off the scene. And uh, we left off in our last program with the scientific laws of thermodynamics. And the second law, remember, was kicked in when Adam sinned. And with sin came death. And so the whole creation is under the death knell. Everything is moving closer and closer to oblivion. Now, the average individual on the planet probably never thinks about it, but it is. Everything is going into a less usable state. Even our fossil fuels, as they pump those billions and billions of oil barrels out of the Middle East, it's not being replaced. It's not a replaceable energy source. It's going to one day run out. And the same way with everything in creation, it is constantly moving into a less usable state. And even we, within this body of flesh, as I said in the last program, from the day we're born, death begins. And uh, whether we live to be 10 or 70 or 100, it's beside the point. Death is our final end, of course, short of the rapture. All right, so now then, the, the whole creation is under that same set of circumstances. It is moving closer and closer to the time when it will finally be exchanged, is the word I like to use, for something totally new. All right, now let's look at some scripture verses. Back here in Hebrews 1, again, verse 11. They shall perish all the things that God has created. But thou, the Creator, he remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. What a beautiful illustration. Now, I know a garment doesn't just wear out overnight. That's something that is over a process of time. Well, so is creation. 
as the eons of time are going by, everything is in entropy. It's all going into a less usable state until finally God will undo the whole thing. So it's like a garment. And verse 12, using that same word as a vesture or as a garment, a piece of clothing, thou, the Creator, shall fold them up and they shall be changed, or I think a clearer word there would be exchanged. They're not just only going to be changed from this to that. They're going to be totally destroyed, and we're going to have everything new. But, again, we come back, the Creator never changes. Thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. All right, let's go back once again to the Old Testament, and let's go back to Isaiah 51 first, honey. Isaiah 51, and then we're going to look at Psalms again. Isaiah 51. <clears throat> Dropping down to verse 6. Isaiah 51, verse 6. I'll wait till you find it because we get letters every day. Don't go so fast. I can't find the scriptures. Okay, Isaiah 51, verse 6, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. Now here it comes. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. The earth shall wax old like a garment. See, the same language. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever my righteousness shall not be abolished. All right, now I'd like to bring you all the way back to Psalms 102 this time instead of 104. Let's come back to Psalms 102. Psalms 102. Now, a lot of time we read these psalms and, and we don't read them. You know, I, I'm always stressing that, that we do so much reading of the Bible and we really don't read it. Now, here's another few verses. I would wager that most people, if they've read it, they've missed one of these major points. Psalms 102, verse 21. All got it? Psalms 102, dropping in at verse 21. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion and His praise in Jerusalem, when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord, he weakened my strength in the way, he shortened my days. Now what do you, world, do you suppose he's talking about? How old was Christ when his life on earth was ended? 33, right in the prime of life, we normally think. And so that's the reference here. That here, as he was now living in that area below the angels, as Paul writes in Philippians, he had humbled himself, and he's here in the flesh as the God-man. Now he cries out to the Father. I said, oh, verse 24, oh my God. See, that's why Christ in the flesh can refer to the Father as his God. It, it's just from that position where he is as the man God, see? And now he cries out to the Father, and I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, at the very height of his youthful vigor. Thy years are throughout all generations. Now again, as God the Son addresses the Father from his place on earth, of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Now, here we come back to the same language that we've been seeing in Hebrews and in Psalms and uh, various other portions of Scripture. They, verse 26, the work of creation, they shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. Isn't it amazing how the Scripture just repeats itself? You know what I've always said? What's the purpose of repetition? Emphasis. Emphasis. God wants us to understand this old world didn't go forever. That's what most people today think. Not all well. There, there's no end to it. It'll just keep going and keep going. No, it won't. 
there's a day coming when God's going to wrap it up like an old worn out garment. All right, back to the text in Psalms 102, verse 26. As a vesture thou shalt change them or exchange them, and they shall be changed. But God never changes. God the Son will never change. But thou art the same, and thy years have no end. Well, that's the psalmist's way of putting it, see? All right, now then let's come back and look at some of the New Testament analogies to when this old planet is going to meet its end. Come back with me now to 2 Peter, the little epistle of Peter, with this same thought that there's coming a day when not just even the earth, but I feel the whole universe will be totally done away with because everything has to be made new. Now why? Because there isn't a corner of this universe that hasn't been defiled by that old devil, Satan. He's defiled it all. He's been into the presence of God in heaven. You know that. He's been, I think, to the ends of the universe and it's all defiled. Consequently, it's going to have to be destroyed. All right, verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll give you a moment to find it. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord, which of course goes right on past the tribulation and through the kingdom until we come into eternity. And always remember, a thousand years with God is just a day. So don't think in terms as we look at it, but in the light of God's thinking, it's all in one successive time. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which, now watch the language, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything is suddenly going to return to the nothingness from which it came. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Now, you know what dissolved things look like. I mean, the heat just melts it down, and if you keep the heat on it long enough, it's going to be nothing. All right? And so it's going to be dissolved. Consequently, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation or manner of lifestyle and godliness? Verse 12, looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God when eternity will be ushered in, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved. See, there's twice we've had the word dissolved in two verses. And the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements that make up matter shall melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, but it's not a hopeless case. Nevertheless, we as believers, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. All right, now then let's go all the way back to Revelation. Revelation puts the capstone on it in almost the same identical language. Let's go to chapter 20, first of all. Chapter 20, verse 11. Chapter 20, verse 11. Keeping in mind this whole concept that Everything that's in the universe was created by a loving and merciful God to provide everything that was needed for all life forms, whether it's human, animal, marine, birds, whatever. He provided for all of them. But all right, now verse 11, as we are ready to usher in to eternity. Verse 11, Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, which of course will be the sun, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, 
and there was found no place for them. They're gone. Gone. Disappeared. No hope? Yeah, there's hope. Now Revelation 21, verse 1. Almost identical language with Peter. But John is now writing. <coughs> Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a what? New heaven and a new earth, undefiled, perfect. Oh, I think it's just going to be beyond human comprehension. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and with it went all the defilement, all of the residue of the wickedness of the ages is gone, and nothing now but purity and beauty and righteousness. God's holiness is evident everywhere. All right, and so the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And then upon this new planet, then John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared. Now, it doesn't call it the bride. Now, I had someone write the other day and wanted to know if the new Jerusalem was the bride of Christ. It doesn't say that. It merely says that this new city is going to come down with all the beauty of a bride. Now, I've made this statement on the program before, and nobody has ever really argued the point. Iris and I have been to our share of weddings, and you know, we have never seen an ugly bride. <laughs> Am I right? They're always beautiful. They're always beautiful. And that's why the scripture uses that analogy. A bride is always beautiful. And so this city is going to come down with the beauty and the majesty and the purity of that little bride dressed in white. And it doesn't say the city is the bride. It just says it's going to have that beauty likened to a bride. See, that's where we, I think we have to be careful with language, that we don't just say, well, the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. It doesn't say that. It merely says it is as beautiful as a bride. So all things will be made new. And of course, I've always said, if you realize as you go on into chapter 21, you see this new city four square. Coming back to Hebrews, honey. This new city four square is going to be, if we can understand scripture uh, dimensions, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 wide, and 1,500 miles high. You and I can't imagine the square footage in something like that. Now that's a city that would reach from this pleasant present day planet from New York to Denver, from Denver to Mexico City, and from Mexico City out into the South Atlantic and back to New York. And just as high. Well, I read the other day, and th this is mind boggling, that if you give every individual three square feet, we could put all of the population of our United States of America, which is about 275 million, within the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> now that'll throw you a curve, won't it? Now that just goes to show you how many people can be put into that kind of an area. And then look at a city 1,500 miles cubed. You think heaven's going to be crowded? Forget it. Forget it. And that's just the city. That doesn't give in to the rest of the universe that I think we're going to have access to. Oh, listen, eternity is something to get excited about. Because I think a lot of people sort of get the idea. In fact, I had a young lady just, I think, in our Oklahoma City seminar the other day. She said, well, I've always been taught that heaven is just going to be sort of floating around and, uh, yeah, strumming a harp. And uh, No, that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be a place of intense activity, music that'll just blow us away, and joy and happiness like you and I can't comprehend. And then as I asked a gentleman on the phone just yesterday, I said, now I think he was from Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. And I said, now, do you, like Iris and I do, especially we're in the big city traffic, and all these lanes are just Hurry, scurrying back and forth. 
then we have to look at each other once in a while and just say, how many of them ever think of eternity? And you know what his answer was? The same as ours. Very few. They never stop to think of this eternity that's waiting for us who believe. And so it is so sad that, that here our Creator God is in such control of everything, and He's setting everything up for glory. And the vast majority of mankind could care less. They'll live their 70 years or more on this old planet and try to live it up the best they can, and that's it. Is it any wonder we feel sorry for them? I do. I feel sorry for them because they just don't know what they're missing. All right, let's uh, come back to Hebrews then again. Uh, so they'll be folded up, verse 12, and they shall be exchanged. In other words, it's going to be burned up. Oh, I knew what I was going to use. I was going to use an illustration. I think I put it on a program years ago. I had read an article in a scientific journal that I was subscribing to at that time. And uh, it was written by a multi-degreed physicist. And if I'm not mistaken, he was down at the University of Texas, but that's irrelevant. But he was writing an article on, of course, the origin of the universe, which a lot of scientists are all hung up on. And uh, his final statement or two was so shocking that uh, once in a while I just got to get her attention, you know, and I say, honey, listen to this. And I read it to her. You know what he said? He said, I finally have come to the conclusion that all of the universe came from one single source of light. Well, so far, so good. But it was his next statement that just blew me away. And he says, I can foresee the day. No idea how far into the future, but he says, I can foresee the day when this whole universe will come right back into that original source of light. And isn't that exactly what the scriptures teach? God created it all out of nothing. He didn't start with something. He created out of nothing. And he's going to bring it all back from whence it came and recreate it. And I doubt if the gentleman had any idea how close to the truth he really came. But anyway, even though God has let the universe run however long you want to think it's been here, whether it's billions or thousands, that's irrelevant. But the day is coming, it's all going to disappear, but God remains. He is still going to be in control. Uh, let's see, I hope it's in the last chapter of Hebrews. Go to the chapter, last chapter of Hebrews, which is 13, honey. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to start with verse 5, but the verse I really want is verse 8. But I so often do, you know, when I'm teaching, I'll see something uh, in a previous verse that I think is just as good as the one I was going to go to, so we're going to use it. Hebrews chapter 13, and let's drop down to verse 5. Okay? Let your conversation or your manner of living be without covetousness. Now, you remember what Paul said about covetousness? Remember? Back there in Romans chapter 7? Covetousness is what triggers all other sin. Now, you think about that for a week or two. Covetousness is the trigger for all other sin. And so, here's the admonition. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, here's the promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord, God the Son, the Redeemer, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. But then come down to verse 8, Jesus Christ, the Creator, the one who is now higher than the angels, the one who is the creator of everything, the one who will one day destroy everything. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. He'll never change. And you see why our faith is on bedrock? He will never 
never change. All right, for the full couple, three minutes we have left, let's come back again to Hebrews chapter 1. Oh, goodness, I don't know why I always end up with a subject that's going to take an hour when I've only got three minutes left. But uh, I'm not going to fudge. I'm not going to try and just fill the three minutes with empty words. We'll go on into the next verse. Verse 13. Because, see, when I try to plan for four programs, it is impossible, utterly impossible for me to know where I'm going to end a particular half hour. I've tried over the years, and it's just impossible. So all we can do is just take it as the Spirit leads, and if we don't finish it this half hour, we'll pick it up in the next. All right, so let's go on into Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. Now remember, we're showing throughout all these verses how that God the Son is above the angelic hosts. His power is more than the concentration of the millions upon millions of angels. He is far above them. All right, so now then, verse 13. To which of the angels, see? To which of the angels did he say at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Now I'm going to give you some homework. You just take a good concordance and see how many times the Scripture in all the various authors and all the different books, how many times the Holy Spirit prompts the writers of Scripture to go back to this verse. You will be amazed. I think probably this verse is quoted more often throughout the Bible as a whole than any other Scripture. Now, I, I'm just saying that uh, as a question. Uh, I really think so because I was just amazed as I was preparing for this how many writers refer to this verse. All right, our time is just about gone, but read it again. Which of the angels did he say at any time, sit on my right hand until, that's the time word, remember, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Now, the first thing I want you to contemplate as we get ready then for the next half hour what is the picture of the world being his footstool? Well, have you ever heard the expression, he's got his foot on their neck? Think about it. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.